gone. <laughs> Amen. I want to reiterate to you next week is when Gene Garcia with Teen Challenge is going to be here. So if you know anyone who struggles with any kind of addiction, from a food addiction to alcohol, drugs, to watching too much YouTube or shopping too much, uh, that was a joke. Uh, but it might apply. Who knows? Uh, but anyway, invite your friends, your family, anybody, everybody you can. Gene is going to tell his personal story of how he found, how he came to the Lord and was delivered and got free from, from a, a long time drug addiction. And today he serves the Lord in, in, in Teen Challenge. So it's going to be a really a good time and, uh, and a really good testimony that's going to be fun to look to, uh, to hear him share that with us. This week, Lori and had invited me to go be a part of something that she did the week before and she, <laughs> I don't even want to admit it because it just really tells her it tells her uh, she went to silver sneakers <laughs> okay so if you don't know what that is I'm not going to tell you because that that's that's incriminating to do that but silver sneakers I'm gonna go ahead and tell it silver sneakers is a program that insurance companies allow and a lot of uh uh, gyms allow and they work with you and but you have to be a, a senior senior age to go to silver sneakers and uh, i had always thought that silver sneakers was the group that uh, couldn't lift their foot above their ankle you know and they exercise like this you know so I, i'm like really you're going to that i mean you're you're pretty healthy I, I know we're getting older she said well you know i just i'm gonna go try it so she did she went the week before and she loved it and came back so talk about how sore she was so she talked me into going, and I thought, you know, I'm always so resistant to, to do things the way I, I, I'm going to go for her sake. I'm going to humble myself, and I go in there. So I get in there, and uh, lo and behold, everybody's over 95, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, it wasn't quite that bad, but <laughs> it was close. <laughs> the lady that was leading the exercises had to be 75 to 80, I'm not sure, and she's leading the group. And, uh, you know, so I'm like, okay, I, I'm going to go with it, you know, and that you sit in the chair to do some of your exercises, you know, if that tells you anything. Uh, you have a ball, and you, you just do different things, you know. Well, an hour later, I was, I was, I couldn't even do everything this woman was doing. <laughs> and, uh, and, I mean, she was killing it. I'm not kidding you. <clears throat> and uh, so... I got done with that and went home, and for, th for, two, for two days, I've been sore as rising. As I... Yeah. But Lori had told me something that she, uh, that she noticed when she went, and uh, whenever I'm doing this, so y'all know I'm adjusting my ears so I know how loud to be, uh, she, she had gone. She said, these people were just, it was like a family atmosphere, and they... They uh, were just having fun together, and she said, I heard some of them say, well, let's go over here to eat when we get through, because it's at 11 a.m. in the morning. Let, let's go eat. She said, I was wishing they would ask me to go eat with them, you know? And, and, and what she entered into was this family that has developed through koinia. And so I'm back on that. We're going to continue talking about relationships and, and talking about koinia and the body life of the church. And, and that's what was happening in that room with those people. As I was trying to, you know, she's saying, you know, do this leg and that arm, that, you know, if, I thought, are you, are you kidding me? I mean, you know, wait a minute. But, and they're all, two thirds of them are doing it. And I'm like, y'all been doing this since you were 50. That's the reason you can do it, you know. And, uh, but so anyway, so all this is going on. And, and, and I'm, there's just real energy in the room, you know, just a, a joy and an excitement, and there were those that were not able to do it, obviously, and, the, and others that could do some, but not all of it. But it was just that real family fellowship. You know, just a it was just a great, great atmosphere, great atmosphere. She asked two of us that were visiting, you know, to share your name. So this lady stood up, shared her name. She asked me, and I said Donald Trump, and uh, <laughs> so. so <clears throat> I felt that kind of liberty in the room, right? I felt that kind of liberty. Uh, plus the guy that was wearing the political shirt, that kind of helped a little bit. At that age, they all wear political shirts. But uh, So 
So God is calling us to be more than just a group of people that meet on Sunday. You know that. Y'all, we've been talking about this, and uh, we're going to continue talking about it as we go along. But, but uh, I remember when I was a kid that whenever we would go swimming or go to, to the pool or to the lake or anything, I was afraid of water. And the reason I was afraid of water, it's a long story, but I had a guy at the YMCA when I was just a small child who was deaf, and he, he would pick kids up and throw them in the pool. And I was already kind of scared and didn't swim well, and, and he came over and he picked me up and he threw me in the pool, and I'm yelling at him, no, 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 but he couldn't hear. So he throws me in the pool. Well, I went into deep water, and out of fear, I started dog paddling <laughs> backwards, so I was going down. And I realized it came to my attention. I know, I know it was the Holy Spirit. Stop what you're doing and s- just stop. So I just stopped. In the midst of all of that fear, I had the capacity to tell myself, you know, the Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind, a disciplined mind. As a believer, you have the ability to control your thoughts. Don't ever think you don't. Own your thoughts. Okay, we're not going to stop there. And so I'm, so I'm doing this, and then it came to me, stop, and I stopped. And the fear was still there. I was still gripped with fear, but I floated to the top, and then I started doing this. And so I got out. Well, that gave me, that put on me a fear of water that kind of lasted for a long time. So as I got older, I would, wa- I would go to the pool or to the, to the lake or whatever, and I wanted to play like every other kid did in the water, and I would start to go in, and there would be these guys that would come run, and they'd dive, hit the water, and they'd come up, <gasps> trying to catch their breath from it being so cold. And then afterwards, I'd watch them as they, they would just, they would adapt to the, to the atmosphere, the temperature, right, the water. And then they just had so much fun playing and splashing. But I was afraid of the water. So I would wade down. I'd get in the three-foot section, and I'd I'd get down real slow, or or, or maybe where you walk down, and it would be on my feet, and it was freezing cold, get up to my ankles, up to my knees, and maybe up to my waist. And I'm I'm just sitting there. I'm like, this is just too cold. I I don't know how y'all do that. But it really was the fear that was keeping me from going all in. I didn't want to jump all in. And and so I, by the end of by the end of this our time to be there swimming and all, I, I I would usually stop about right here because as the cold water got out toward my chest, I felt it was taking my breath. Y'all y'all understand what I'm saying? And so I I would wind up sitting on the side of the pool with my feet dangling in the water so I could be in the water and just watch my friends play. And this describes a whole lot of people in the church. People in today's society are afraid. They are afraid of relationships. They're afraid to get close to people. It's it's like that's that's a cold zone that I can't go into. They're scared to go in very far. And what they don't understand is by not getting all in, not just diving in, and not everybody can dive in. Some people can't wade in. There were those times, honestly, that I could wade in a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? And I could eventually get in up to my neck, but I still would hold on to the edge of the pool. I wouldn't, get, I wouldn't let go and just get out in the middle with everybody and be a part of what was going on. And God is calling us. He wants every one of us to be a part of a church, a body, where we're all active, we're all serving, we're all loving, we're caring, we're fellowshipping, we're working together. You think of these little churches in small communities, community churches, that, that uh, the people grew up in the church and everybody knows everybody if they're not family. They're, you don't have those inhibitions and, and things holding people back. Everybody knows everybody and they're okay with everybody. And I believe that's what God wants. But more than that, that that's a part, that, that fellowship and that koinonia is a place that we began as a people. And then from that, those close, loving, caring relationships where we care about each other. Y'all don't, y'all don't know how much we pray for you. Uh, Ina leads our intercessory prayer. If you're not on the intercessory prayer chain and you're a pray, praying person, you should really talk to her and get on that. But we, we were shooting prayers all day, every day, back and forth on, on our, her Facebook Messenger page. And then I lay awake at night and I go through your names and I pray for different ones that I know are going on. And, and throughout the day, and I care for you. I love you. Lauren, I love you guys. We care about you. You, when you hurt, we hurt, and that's the truth. Whether you can believe that or not, it's the truth. Y'all are a burden to me. 
but it, <laughs> but that's a that's a pastoral uh, a pastoral uh, that's a persecution we have to serve to be a pastor. Now, now we have we have, and if you've heard the term before, we have grace to pastor. We can do that, and we do that because God's given us the grace and the desire and the love for it, and the love for you. And so we have grace to do it. It's not a burden, like I said. Uh, but God wants all of us to become such a family that when somebody's hurting, everybody's helping. Heard that? When somebody's hurting, everybody's helping. And your help could be, I won't say just praying. That's where that's the top level. That's the top of the lounge. Praying. Uh, someone put on a someone shared the other day about a need that they had on our on our prayer line, our intercessory prayer thing, uh, physical need and and and. And I just responded and said, hey, you know, when, we, when you submit these, I want you to know that this is not a joke for us. This, we're praying. We are praying and we're believing. It's not just, we're not just, oh, yeah, yeah, well, now we know who's sick. Hello? You know, you used to hear people that would get on the prayer, get in the prayer group, the prayer chain at churches so they could know the gossip. That's not what it's about. We are, if, if, you, if your name comes up and you're submitted to there for prayer, you're going to get prayed for. And it's by people who really love you and care about you. And so God wants us to not be spectators sitting on the side of the pool with our feet dangling in the water. God wants us to be people who just get all in and just enjoy our, our relationship with God and our relationship to the church and being together with each other. Uh, not last week, that was Easter, but the week before I talked about Ezekiel's vision, for those of you that were here, and Ezekiel chapter 47. The prophet saw a vision of running water, remember this, and it was running through the temple. And the angel led him down into the water, and the further he waited, the deeper the water became. So th this represents our involvement in the church or our fellowship with the body, that the deeper, okay, okay get it, remember the water was running from the temple, down through the temple, and it ran out. And the, well, I'm, I'm going to get into stuff I don't need to get into today. But it ran through the temple. And the angel brought him, and he said, step into the water. And he waded in up to his, his feet and up to his ankles. And he took him, and the angel measured a thousand cubits, and he told him to wait on in. So he went another thousand, and it was up to his ankles, and then to his knees, and then to his west, waist. And then it says he was so deep that he had to swim in the water. It's a picture of the church, I believe, at least for application for t today for this message. It's a picture of God saying he wants all of us to not wade in and just get your feet wet and stop in the house of the Lord, in the temple. He wants us to move on out and be and just let our guards down, be willing to be hurt if you're going to be church people will hurt you. You know why? Because people hurt people. And we're not a perfect group of people. However, I will say this. There's not been a whole lot of that in this congregation in quite a while. Uh, you have elders and, and you have leaders that love you and care about you that will even protect you. Like a husband will protect a wife. And you need to know that. And so sometimes that's misunderstood. But God, the church is a place for us to be together and feel safe. This is your safe zone. This is your safe zone. That's, a, that's kind of a hot topic. You use that right now. You could go all kind of directions with that. I was past the Church of Christ Church early this morning, and there's a police car sitting out on the street. Isn't that a shame that they feel that that's necessary? And uh, obviously, it, you could say it's necessary. We're developing or redeveloping our uh, security team now. We live, in a, we live in that day, whether we like it or not. But let me tell you, I also believe that we have a Holy Spirit power. John, anybody ever seen John Hagee tell his story about when he got shot in the pulpit? And, they, and it was recorded. They play the recording when he tells it. He's standing in the pulpit preaching. The guy walks in the back of the church, runs up to him 20 feet away, shoots, bow, 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 bow. And you hear on the recording, you hear the bullets. Bow, 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 bow. I don't know. It was six or five or six or whatever bullets. And then they jumped him and took him down and the uh when they did the investigation over and he was not hit obviously he said in the middle of the guy running down doing this he just said jesus jesus he said just that just comes out of you right you know and so he cries on jesus the guy pow, 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 pow. and so that when they did the investigation and ran the 
you know how they run a string from where his gun was to where the bullet holes are? That I think it was like three of the bullets should have passed through his body, and there was no explanation of why they didn't. Well, there is an explanation. The Holy Ghost said, I'm going to turn that, bu- that bullet, you know? And, uh, yeah. So there's water that runs through the temple, and God wants us to get in the water and be a part of the, good, of, the, of the fellowship of it, not just for the fun and the cool refreshment of having a people that you can be a part of. It's much deeper than that, and that's what we're going to look at. The effect of jumping in the deep has a paramount place in our walk with the Lord. It's not just about being a part of a church, because there's, there are good churches on every corner. Uh, Roger said something to me I thought was funny. I thought it was funny because I identified with it immediately. He said, he said last Sunday when he was coming to church, coming through town, town was full of cars because it was Easter. And, uh, yeah, and it was. I, I saw it too. Came through today, and it was probably a third, 20% of your CEOs, Chris, Christmas and Easter only. So, uh <laughs> So a lot of people see church like that. It's just, it's just church. But I want us to go deeper than that. It's not just church. This is your family. This is the family of God. We have a purpose, and it's not just to show up and meet on Sunday. And we've got to get a bigger vision than that. Our vision's got to be a lot bigger than this so we don't get stuck here. You all with me? And that's not about a facility. This is what God's been speaking to me. That's not about the facility. That's about what happens among us. If it happens among us, it'll blow us out of this place. But if we don't, if we don't grow, and if God's not allowed to move in us while we're here, while he's doing whatever it is he put us here to do, then we could get stuck here. But we're not going to. And so... Be praying with us about a, a place to go. We're still waiting on the Lord for that. But God may have a reason for us to be here. Maybe he's probably trying to squeeze something out of He's trying to squeeze some blood out of our turnip. <laughs> and, uh, and that's not altogether a bad thing either. So what's so important about, about this whole concept of what I'm saying to you? It's what I, I'm calling the God church connection. The God church connection. When we connect with his body, we're even more connected to him. And I, I want us to understand this this morning. When we connect to the body of Christ, we will feel and actually be more connected to God himself. Uh, yeah. So the water in that temple represents the spirit. It's the spirit of God. And the deeper we wade in and fellowship with each other, the deeper we're, we're going to go with the Father and the Son. If you remember the scripture I read, matter of fact, I'm going to read it right now, uh, the, the first day I spoke on this. Uh, John John 1 3 first John 1 3 that which we've seen and we heard and heard we declare to you he's talking about Jesus when he walked with Jesus and that all that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ he, he said we write these things to you about Jesus so that you can have fellowship with us with us And our fellowship, he's talking about the apostles at that time, but it really means the whole church today. And our fellowship is with the Father and it's with the Son. And what he just said, if you heard what he said was, we want you to fellowship with us because we're fellowshipping with them. And when we fellowship together, we fellowship with them. It's the God-church connection. And you can, it's not... It's not healthy thinking to ever think that we can do well as a believer and not be in a part of a local congregation. I'm not saying you're cut off from God, but I'm saying you're you are you're missing a whole. It's like it's like everybody in here, every one of us, are a conduit of something God is doing in our life. We're a conduit for the Spirit to flow to the rest of us in here. <clears throat> When we used to travel, <coughs> excuse me, do traveling ministry, who, whoever, we were in college, whoever there had a baby with them, brought, brought their child with them, we would pray over their children. I, I mean, sometimes a six-month-old. We'd pray over that six-month-old baby that God would release through that child his spirit. Yeah. Because when you are a living, breathing, spirit-filled person, and we believe those children are covered by the, by the uh, grace of God, until they reach that age that they make a decision, maybe to not make that's up to them. But at that point, we believe that they're blessed and they're, they're a conduit for the Holy Spirit. You are a conduit for God to do something in the house. 
When we come together to worship, and the worship leaders begin to lead us, if we are if we're in an attitude and we don't worship, and we just refuse to go there, either either whatever the reason, if we don't go there, if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to flow through us, we're hindering what He can do to the people around us because He works through people in the earth today. Do you not know that God could 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 step down or either just point his finger and save the whole world right now if he wanted to. He could change everything. He's God. He could change his whole plan, pattern, and way of, of, of the gospel being presented. But he's not going to do that because he's God and he changes not, Scripture says. So what did he do? He set up that men, Paul put it this way, how will they know without a preacher? He's established a method for which people are to come, be brought into the kingdom of God. And that method is you and I. And God's wanting to flow through you. It's not about you just coming and being here. It's a part of you coming here and being here for me and for the people all around you so that God can touch them and meet their needs that day, whatever they may be. All right. So let me read that, that statement again because it's going to get me back on the road. Here we go. The, deep, the deeper we wade in and fellowship with each other, the deeper that we'll go with the Father and the Son and the more we experience the Spirit's work in our life, this is what I, where, where the Lord's got me headed with this that I'm going to share with you today. The deeper and the more we go into fellowship with one another, it takes us somewhere in God where the Spirit can flow and move and operate. You know, that we could easily come in here some Sundays when things don't seem to flow real well and we get out and, man, I'm glad church is over today, you know, whatever. And not realize that some of the reasons that we didn't feel that movement of the Spirit is because we were a block. Yeah. Oh, we're the worship leader, so and so today, and we can, I'm sure we're all guilty of this kind of thing. Sometimes we, 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 as humans, we want to, we want to find a reason to blame something, everything on something, so we think we can fix it. If I, if I can find something to blame, well, then here's the problem, and here's what I can fix. Right. And so we're all thinking, well, I'll just get rid of that worship leader. <laughs> I'm, I'm using y'all because it's not pointing at the preacher right now. <laughs> I can't afford to find another job at 61 years of age. <laughs> oh, whatever it is, those people just don't worship the church. Well, no, you didn't because you were noticing them. Amen. Anyway, I'm going to move on before I get in trouble. <laughs> so this is all made clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Who's, who's familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Well, you will be, because I know every one of you signed on to read through your Bible this year. So you will be getting there. Those of you that did, there are a lot of us that are reading through the Bible. If, if, you, if you're not, I, this is a good time to jump in. Uh, I'm going to tell you, it, it, it does something for you to just read through Scripture. Not really study, just read through. And then you can come back and study when you, when you need to study. But just reading through, you get this bigger picture of what God is do, has done and is doing. It just, it's just, it opens up a big picture. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that chapter is a chapter where he talks about the gifts of the Spirit. And God working in the church and prophecy and, evangel and uh, uh, tongues and interpretation of tongues and faith. And all the gifts of the Spirit, words of knowledge, words of will, uh, wisdom. All these things are talked about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So he starts out in that chapter talking about the administration of those gifts. And he says there are three different administrations. And he tells what they are. And then he, he's going to, he, you know, he, he'll go on down and then he's going to tell what the actual types of gifts are. Then he comes right out of, after talking about the gifts of the Spirit and how they are to function in the church. Or who's, what the ranking authority is. Then he goes into the body. Where he's talking about, you'll recognize this, where he says the ear can't say to the eye, I have no need of you. Right? He talks about those, th those things, about how important each one of us is in, in our particular purpose and part in the church. And then he ends that chapter by saying that God has given uh, these in, in ranking order in the church. First, apostles. Then, I think it's prophets. But he goes down and he talks about it. He, he puts other gifts in there, administration gift and other things like that. He says that this is the way it works. So with that understanding of who we are in the church, 
This chapter gives us three things that I want to say to you real quick. Okay, you ready? Number one, this chapter defines our role in the body. Each person has his own place in the function of the church. You have a place to function in the church. You have a place. And you may feel like, well, I just don't know what that is. I don't know where I fit. Well, uh, come ask me and I'll tell you. No. Uh, pray about it and just ask the Lord, what can I do? And it, I, I'm gonna point, I point Kathy out per- periodically because, because what she does goes unseen to most of you. She prepares our communion elements. How long have you been doing that, Kathy? So long she doesn't remember, and I don't have to, as a pastor, get up on Sunday morning and try to run around scramble and find somebody to get communion ready. Now, that could look to one person like it's not a big deal. Anybody could do that. It's a big deal to me. When I don't have to worry about who's going to set chairs up, I don't have to worry about who's going to run sound. Is, is somebody going to? These guys come in here at 7.15 to 7.30 and set up sound equipment and, and computers and things of that nature so that we can we can have uh, that benefit in, in, in the church while, we're, while we worship together. Others of you are praying at night or getting burned up with Facebook messages. <laughs> I mean, we, we get burnt, don't we? <clears throat> it's constant. That's a part of the body. That's, that's a function in the body. Others of you are mother figures, and you don't know it, and father figures, and you don't realize it, that people are watching you. They're looking to you. If you fall, somebody's going to fall, and you may never know what happened. Listen, I've been a pastor for years, and I've seen this stuff. I've seen how, how, how one person can impact so many lives and never know that they did. And it may be when I preach to their funeral that all of a sudden people are just pouring out, pouring out, not knowing what an impact your, your life has. So, back to this real quick. So, it defi- that chapter defines our role in the body. Number two, it honors those who are often overlooked. He says our, our uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what the term was, uncomingly un- un- parts or something like that. Uh, your embarrassing parts <laughs> of your body. Okay? Things you don't want to show anybody. <laughs> he, he's talking about it. I, y'all wonder where in the heck is he talking. It's in First Corinthians chapter 12. I'm trying not to read that whole chapter to you. I'm trying just to hit it because I'm running some reps. But he says our, our uncomely parts are more honored than our comely parts. The, the parts that you show your face isn't it weird? Isn't it weird that every human being has this innately built within their psyche that there's a part of your body that you don't want people looking at? <laughs> what if it was ears and we all had to wear muffins? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, think about it. Why is that part of the body <laughs> needs to be covered up? <laughs> well, I mean, there's some obvious answers to that. <laughs> One thing, it's ugly. But uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm teased. Preacher better move on. Uh, <laughs> but, but, Paul, but Paul says in there that the uncomely parts are really honored more than the other parts. They get more, they get, uh, move on. Number three, <laughs> number three. Uh, that chapter, he, he defines our role in the body. He talks about how uh, there's honor for those, those parts of the body that are often overlooked. And uh, so I'm an armpit, and you don't see me because my arms are down. But the armpit is important, right? It cools the body. It has a function. It does something. So, it, And the third thing is this. In this chapter, it solid, they, Paul solidifies the unity of the faith. We need each other. We cannot separate ourselves from the body and think that that's healthy in any way. And yet, I know I say this a lot, but I'm I'm trying to impress it upon you because we are coming, we're moving, we have moved into and are going deeper and deeper into a a culture and a society that is going to do everything they can to convince you that going to church, you're just, you're you're uneducated, uh, you're stupid, you're you're a laughing stock. You know, this culture, the, the whole woke thing, it, it, they, what they do is they shame us into not speaking. 
And it's going to be where they're going to shame us into not doing, not witnessing, not preaching, not talking about Jesus on the job, not, not attending church. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Uh, that's where it's going. And so we've got to do the opposites. And so chapter 12 solidifies the unity of the faith, the fact that we need one another and that we can't be separated from one another and be healthy. When we don't press in, wait on down in there, when we don't try to move on into the fellowship and become a part of what God is doing, it's easy to walk away from the church without any pain. There's no tearing apart, or as Jesus put it, putting asunder of what was never joined to begin with. We made this move. There will be some people that will just fall off the tree and feel no pain. And if that happens, these are people who were never apart. They never waded in. They might have been there. They might have done a job. They might have whatever. But if they never waded on in to the spirit of what God is doing in the house, they can walk away and feel nothing. And then we're over here feeling like, man, where'd they go? There, there, are, there are people who walk away and feel great pain and wish they hadn't. But y'all know what I'm talking about. It's different kind of people. Jesus said this about let, it, let not a man put asunder. He's talking about marriage. He said, Scripture says in uh, Matthew 19, and, he's, and he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that which that he which made them at the beginning, made them male and female? Y'all need to remember that. <laughs> okay? Uh, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his mother and father, Cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall become one flesh. For this reason, this is the first verse in the Bible about marriage. It's in Genesis chapter 3. Jesus is quoting it. He says, For this call shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave, and cleave unto his wife. And uh, leaving, cleaving, and weaving is the way we term it. Leaving. Leave his mother and father. Cleave unto his wife. Uh, that, that's, that, that Hebrew word means to glue together. When a man leaves, he's, when a man gets married, he needs to take his wife and they need to leave home. <laughs> that, that's what needs to happen. <laughs> and, uh, and then they need to be glued together and cleave together. And then they need to be woven together. Their life becomes one. You start interweaving and, and your life becomes one thing. And Jesus said that. He quoted that scripture. And then he added this. What therefore God has joined together. He's talking about marriage. Let not a man put, to, put asunder. Let not a man put asunder. Listen, if God has joined us together as a body, there may be times when, when yeah, you, you need to change church, you know. Maybe you're moving, you're transferring to another country, another city, or, or, uh, or maybe there's other reasons that the Lord speaks to you. But when God brings us together, God brings us together. Let me read something I read last night at 2 o'clock in the morning. True story. Uh, in Deuteronomy, through my, my reading through the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 2. Well, let me just go ahead and read from verse 1. And it shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and you possess it and you dwell in it. That you shall take some of the first of the produce of the ground, this is your tithe, which you shall bring from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put that fruit in a basket, and what's this? And go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name. Uh, God chooses where he's going to put his name. We don't choose that. In Genesis chapter 4, I think it is, when Cain and Abel, the Cain and Abel story comes up, and Eve uh, uh, became a child, or she, however it's worded, and she bore a child, and his name was Cain, and then she had Abel. And it says, in, in the process of time, there's a process of time. There is a time that we are to worship. There is a time. And under the old covenant, it was a Sabbath on Saturday. Under the new covenant, I'm a believer that it's the Lord's day, which is Sunday. That there is a time that we are to come together. And, and people say, well, you know, we're two or three of you agree. It's touching anything there I am in the midst. That's absolutely a scripture. It's the truth. And there Jesus is when two or three of us agree in prayer. But he didn't say it constitutes church. The ecclesia. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul said, 
Therefore, and he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit, tongues and prophecy and all this stuff, and the confusion they were having in the church. Everybody was going crazy with all these gifts, and he was trying to clarify and straighten it out and show them how it's supposed to be done. He says, therefore, when the whole church comes together, and he goes on and makes his case. There's a time for the whole church to come together. Uh, Luke chapter 3, there's a verse that says, and on the Sabbath, Jesus went into the synagogue which was his custom. Aren't you glad Jesus knew to go to church? <laughs> it was his custom. The apostles, the disciples, they all went into the synagogue because that was, the, that was the, the appointed place at that time. They all went into the synagogue to worship on the Sabbath. But then lo and behold, when you get over to the book of Acts, after the church has matured and the Holy Spirit has come and God is doing his new thing, Jesus has died and been raised again on Sunday, which we now call the Lord's Day. It's in Revelations. It's referred to as the Lord's Day. You find Paul going into a meeting with the, with the people. Uh, he's about to leave, uh, leave the city, and so he, he wanted to meet with them on this day. It was on the Lord's Day, it says. And that's when he's preaching, and he preached so long into the night to Eutychus is sitting in the window on the second floor. A dude falls asleep and falls out. That's good preaching. Actually, it's comforting to me. It's biblical for y'all to fall asleep if I preach. So, But uh, anyway, so, so Jesus said, what God has put together, let not man put asunder. I want to I wanna stay with that word for just a second. This word occurs 22 times in the King James Version, 13 times in the Old Testament, 9 in the New Testament. It's found in, com, com, in a combination with these words. These words are the, uh, the, main, the major point where that word put asunder is translated. It's found in combination with these words. Break, burst, cleave, depart, cut, divide, pluck, and saw. So, it basically what I'm saying is this. Jesus said, whatever God puts together, don't let a man break it up. Burst it apart. Don't, don't depart from it. Don't get cut off from it. Don't be divided among yourselves. Don't get plucked out. These are all words that are used in the King James Bible that is put in, combina in, in combination with. And, and saw. <clears throat> Don't let anybody saw you out. Of Don't let anybody cut you off from, from where God has placed you. You know, as Scripture says, joy comes in the morning. Uh, we all go through seasons of days and nights, light and darkness. Uh, we go through winter seasons and 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 then there's spring and summer and fall. We go through transitions. There's things that happen. Things come. Things go. Churches are good sometimes and they're not good the other time, from our carnal perspective. But there's there's uh, uh, you can do a you can do an experiment with a plant. You can plant a seed in a cup. Let it let it germinate and let it birth. Let it let it begin to break ground. And when it's germinated. Then you can put another cup on top of that and hide it in the dark. And you would think it would die, but it doesn't. What happens is, as long as you water it like you need to, what happens is that root will then grow very deep, and you'll have a much healthier plant when the cup is removed. Now, you can't do it so long that it dies because it's not getting sun and photosynthesis is happening and all that kind of stuff. But you want to keep that thing covered for a period of time, and the darkness will make the root grow down. It will then begin to get nutrition, and when it comes up, boom, you're going to have a, a, a good, healthy plant. So when things don't seem to be at their best, it's not the time to, to pick your bags up and go. It may be that God's got you in a place that he's, he's got you in a dark place because he wants to grow a root deeper because maybe something's coming down the road that you ain't strong enough for right now. And he don't want you plucked out of the kingdom. He don't want anybody sawing you down, tearing you apart. When we've not been soaked in the spirit of what God is doing, there's nothing to hold us, which explains why some people talk about how great things are at church at the same time the guy on the other side of the room is talking about all the problems and his concerns in the same house. I've had many times people approach me. I, you probably have too, um, Keith, where... Where 
Somebody will come up to me after church and say, Pastor, that was a great sermon, or, or what God's doing here is exciting, and just talk about it, talk about it. And honestly, the same service, somebody else will come up and say, man, I've just got this issue I need to talk about. I've got a concern. That's the word they use. Don't ever come to me and say you're con- you have a concern. <laughs> just say, I'm freaking mad. Let me tell you what's going on. I'm good with that. I have a concern. That's the way they disguise. That's the way they disguise something that is not of God. Don't bring me a concern. Just come to me and say, this is what's going on. I'm okay. Because we all have times things aren't the best. <laughs> right? There are always going to be people in the church and people in the ministry and leadership that are not doing what they ought to be doing the way they ought to be doing it or they've got sin in their life. And those things need to be dealt with. We need to talk about it. We need to work through it. We need to help each other grow because we're a family. And when your brother did something stupid when you were a child, you didn't throw him out of the family because he did something stupid. You work through these things. You communicate. I'm, I'm taking I'm, none of this in my notes, so I need to hurry and quit. Okay, so I'm just going to end with this. I'm not even going to do what I was going to do. Here it is. One, okay, let me read it. Which explains why some people talk about how great things are in the church and others see problems and concerns only. So one is swimming in the cold water, and it feels amazing. The other is ankle deep and afraid of the breathtaking splash. They can't swim together. How can two walk together unless they agree? So let's look at the different levels of koinia. I told you that three weeks now. I got seven levels. I'm not going to do that to you right now. I didn't get there yet, so we'll do that. We'll do that next. All right. Do you love your church? It feels different saying that right now because we don't feel like we got a church. That's, yeah, that is how far off base the American church is. That's how far off base it is. Y'all said it. We are the church. We are the church. I tell you, you know, when we're praying for Edward, he came up for prayer. If I can just use you for an example and humiliate, I'm teasing. Uh, uh, He will agree with this. When Edward uh, calls or texts and says, hey, Pastor, this is what, uh, you know, I'm dealing with with my physical body, uh, he didn't, he didn't. Go go to 6111 Casey Lane, stand in the front yard and talk to the building. Right? Because the church is people. And the church is where God is working and where God is alive and he's active. The people that, that uh, take that mindset that I can be a Christian and not go to church, and they're right. I'm not saying they can't. And that's fine. But they're estranged from the family. They are estranged from the family. And those are the kind of people that are the maddest. Because I'm, as a realtor, and I do a lot of estate sales, and you know, we sell houses that are in a state. I got a house under contract right now that uh, has five family members that have to all sign off. And the, the other realtor told me, he said, one of them is a rear end. <laughs> so, but the people that are estranged from the family are the ones who show up wanting the most when they want something. Oh, come on, you didn't even hear what I just said. When we bring a special speaker in, they show up to get all the glory and all the goodness and all what's God going to do. But no, they don't want to maintain. They don't want to serve. They don't want to keep the doors open so you can bring that guy in who brings a special thing. They just want, I had a guy come one time. I had Dwayne Sheriff in doing a, doing a preaching for me, doing a series when we had started a little church in Oklahoma. And uh, this guy comes in and, and, and he visits, and Dwayne comes in and preaches. Dwayne's phenomenal. He comes in and preaches until this visitor comes, and he sits there, and I don't know what I said. I have no idea. Something to follow what Dwayne had said. I don't know. Uh, I, I thought it was right. Maybe it wasn't. But uh, So this guy comes up to me afterwards, and he, he walked up to me, and he said, he said, uh, he said, he said uh, Brother Darrell, he said, and I didn't know him. He said, I, I don't, he said, I don't know who you are. He said, but he said, Dwayne blesses me. Dwayne loves me. Dwayne, like, you put a load on me, but Dwayne loves me. Dwayne loves me. I'm like, get out of my church. No, I didn't. <laughs> but I'm just saying that mindset. So he probably, you know, he's a groupie. He's a groupie, like at a rock concert. These people just pop around and go to what they, you know, Jesus, uh, Paul said that in the last days, there's going to be men with tickling ears. No, they don't want to get in here and work hard. They don't want to come set up a church so people can worship. They don't want to take care of children. That's a chore for some, but some do it. And, and for others, it's a gift, and they love it. But, but somebody's got to serve. They don't want to participate. They don't want to get involved. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying you've got to have a working place in the church. I'm saying 
I'm saying you're gonna, you need to be a part of the body, what God is doing, the move of the Spirit. And when you're in there, when you wade down that deep into where you're swimming now, man, it's just a great place to be. It's fun. And then the other guys are sitting on the side with their feet dangling in the water thinking, I really wish that was real and I could be in it. And they don't know it ain't real because they won't get in it. They won't get past it. Amen. Okay. Stand up with me, if you will. Praise the Lord. God is a good God. And y'all are good people. All the time. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. You know what? I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play off that real quick, though. That's what Jesus thinks. That's what Je- I can. I can hear him, Philip. We say God is good, and Jesus looks at the Father and says, "They are good all the time, because they don't see our faults." Once you're under the blood, I heard this illustration years ago, and, and to me, it's just uh, it's always stuck with me. Those of you that are a little bit older we had these things in school with a red piece of plastic and you slid words underneath it and the red there were red words so you couldn't see them and then the one pops up into the window and so that that's kind of that's the way it is with us once we're born into the kingdom once we're born again you're under the blood and all of your bad words the bad words spoken against you uh, they're all under the red and, and Jesus don't see them father doesn't see them we are in Christ. We are in Him. And we'll trust the answer come. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Father, we thank you. Father, I thank you for this body. I thank you for this church. Lord, I thank you for these, these this group right here that have just said, hey, we're, we're going on with where God's going. And we're here today together. And uh, it's, it's just neat. It's neat being in your presence. It's neat seeing what you're doing. Not, not fully understanding it. Uh, but here we are. But here we are. And, and it's a good thing, God. You're working You're working something in us that one day we're going to look back and we're going to say, I remember when we were at the lumber yard. And we're going to see clearly what you were doing. And, Lord, it's good. I feel it now. I'm, ex- I, I'm just I'm sensing the presence of the Lord. I've got more of a liberty and a freedom to preach here than I did where we were. I don't know what it's about. I just know you're moving. Lord, I know there's something going on. And so, Father, we, we want to... We want to not get stuck with the four, uh, us four and no more mentality. But, Father, we speak to the lost in this community. And, God, we call them into the kingdom of God. Well, they don't have to come to this church, but send them into a church, whether it's with us or, or with another church that's preaching Jesus, that will guide them in the way that they should go. Lord, we would love for it to be here, Lord. You just bring people in. Fill the house with the lost, Lord. Lord, give us diapers to change, Lord. And, and, and we, we, we need some of that again. We, we, we just need to see the kingdom expand, Lord. We need to see it expand. And so, Lord, as the, as the water flowed through the temple in Ezekiel, at the end of it, we talked about this the other day, uh, it, where the water came out, there was all kinds of fish. And the fishermen were there fishing all day long. Every month they were bringing in the harvest. And so, Lord, Father, we thank you that that's going to be the outcome of what you're doing us as a church we're gonna we're gonna be church a church that wins the lost and builds the kingdom and makes disciples for jesus so you're gonna have to make all that happen we can't do it except the lord build the house they that build it labor in vain so thank you for doing that using us and i thank you for these good people lord in jesus name